Hey everyone, I'm Chelsea Cross, host of Hashtag Millennial Talk Twitter chat. Feels really good to be back here on Blab. It's been a few weeks. It's been crazy. I feel like the past month has been a whirlwind of events. Um, so I'm happy to be back on Blab, happy to be back with you guys. We have an amazing lineup for uh, tonight's Twitter chat. We have a great de uh, guest with us this evening. You may already recognize him. You may already know him. He's quite popular. He's been around the block. His name is David Villa. He is the best-selling author, speaker, and trainer. He is also the CEO of IPD, a world-class marketing agency. If you don't know about IPD or haven't heard of it, IPD is one of the largest privately held automotive solution companies in America, specializing in direct mail, business development, advertising, database management, printing, fulfillment, premiums, incentives, and the lead generation. I know I'm really excited about tonight's topic. We talk about a lot of things in the entrepreneurial landscape. We talk a lot, a lot of things about business and marketing, empowering all of us to pursue our own passion today. We haven't really talked about company culture and how to create a, a winning company culture. And for me, when I was thinking about this topic, I was really excited to talk about it from an intermittent entrepreneur's perspective for all of us building our own small businesses. You know, the people you bring into that startup or or your or your personal brand, that's, that's your baby. And it's really hard to release the reins and trust a lot of people, you know, with one, with your passwords and two, with your creative. Um, so I'm really excited to talk on a small and large scale about creating company culture with David this evening. David's going to be multitasking along with myself. You can see he's got a really great setup tonight. David, you're putting me to shame here. Um, he's going to be Facebook uh, doing Facebook Live. He's also going to be tweeting. We're also going to be blab chatting as well as the audio and visual we're recording tonight. So we'll be able to post it on YouTube tomorrow. David, welcome. So happy to have you. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, Chelsea, it's uh, first of all, it's my pleasure. Thank you for uh, for inviting me. It's uh, it's quite an honor. So, hey, we're just here. We're here at our studio. So we uh, this Looking is what we good. do. Thank you. Looking good over there. Yeah, I like the, I like the setup. I think I have to uh, I have to like create a better aesthetic in my new place. I'm also moving, David, on top of everything. So you cannot see what's going on around us. It is complete mayhem. Um, but all has stopped <laughs> for tonight's Twitter chat. So let's get to it, David. We have a lot of content, a lot of ground to cover. Let's get ready. Start prepping your answers for question one. I'm about to send out question one right now on Twitter. <clears throat> All right, and then I also, David, send out the question on in our Blab chat, so our Blabbers over here will also be sharing their answers, thoughts, opinion, insight on Blab chat as well. All right, so David, let's, let's jump into it. So our first cue of the evening is, you've said that the most important thing for a successful company is company culture. Hence our topic this evening: how to win and create a winning, uh, how to create a winning company culture. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about it. How do we define a, a winning company culture today, and how do we start to try to create one? Sure, sure. Uh, well, thank you. It, um, it's it's a passion of mine, and, and that's why I, I wrote the article recently that uh, was published on Forbes. And um, you know, unfortunately, well, fortunately, and unfortunately, uh, we have to learn a lot of times, Chelsea. I think through mistakes. At least I did. And so quite honestly, I jacked up um, so many times over the last like 20 years that I finally got it right. I think it was uh, Edison that said he didn't fail 999 times. He just found 999 times that something didn't work, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and um, so, you know, when I'm, when I'm looking at culture, you know, I'm sure all of us, you know, in this modern day, we look at like Google and we look at all these companies that, you know, I think got everybody to focus on, you know, hey, how can I be different in, in my workplace? And um, at the same time, I think everybody ran out and got a foosball table, an air hockey table, bean bags, and, and just kind of threw those into a room and said, okay, now I've, now I've imitated what I've, what I've seen. I must have great company culture. And I, I think that you could have all of that and have great culture. You could have all of that and have horrible culture. And so basically, if you have none of that, you could have phenomenal culture if you're in the middle of a car, if, if your office looks like cardboard boxes on the wall, I mean, within reason, I mean, leadership is about what you do, not what you say. And, and the, quite honestly, company culture is about values. And so to sum it up for me, I mean, you know, we're a sales organization primarily, and, you know, we've always talked about selling value. And I think that sharing your values as a leader is far more important than selling value. 
So selling value is very important, but sharing your value. So basically culture to me is a place. Our mission statement here is to create a place where the people who work here can realize their dreams and potential. And that's, that's what it's all about for me. And, and, and the, and the result of that is people come to work because they want to, they do things because they want to, they, they excel as if they, they own the company. I mean, I challenge you to walk in and you know, we have close to 50 employees. Now we're getting ready to take additional 3000 square feet uh, on July one next to us. We're moving the people out. And I challenge yeah. you to find regardless of the age, someone who acts like they don't own this company. When you walk in, that's the result of culture. So I think culture is, is, um, is the most important thing. And I've learned it. I learned it the day I figured it out. I was sitting there and I had lost, it was 2006, I believe. And I was sitting in my office. We had probably at that time, we did $10 million that year. So I thought we have, we were arriving. Hey, we're getting ready to arrive somewhere. And then we had a mass exodus that of people who really said ultimately that, that they weren't on board. And I was looking around an empty sales room and an empty, you know, leadership room and said, well, I don't have this thing figured out. So culture became real important to me right about there. Uh, you know, I, I love so many points within that, David. And one of the things you said, like right off the top is that I don't know about you, but I've learned from a lot of mistakes. Um, and I feel that I've learned the most about from learning from the mistakes because of, and I'm sure that has to deal with trusting the right people or, you know, the way in which you prefer your per put your professional cap versus social cap on. Um, and I think a lot of us, you know, it's that whole, uh, where's the barrier between your employee and your friend, right? And and finding that happy medium between both because you have to have that healthy and happy rapport. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, wh whoever's the boss is the boss and whoever has to report to the boss has to respect that, that that's his senior. And I think, you know, for a lot of millennials, you know, a lot of millennials are, are stepping up in the workplace and also now more than ever becoming their own entrepreneurs, creating their own businesses, uh, brands, launching their own apps, you know, we're all, all the digi generation. Um, and we're all young. So you have these 20 and 30 year olds. I know this happens in Santa Monica all the, all the time. And it's all these young people working under the same roof, mm -hmm. which is really fun, or it could be really sticky. So I, 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 I'm curious as to before we have to learn from our own mistakes are there any tips that you think are first and foremost you know here are the things that i've learned yeah well i think that uh, you know and kind of maybe jumping to the, the the cherry kind of on top type of deal but um i think that it starts with purpose and you know i guess that's really what i'm getting at it's it, it, you know i know we're not talking about branding tonight but let me let me kind of maybe draw a draw a, a picture to branding maybe someone will get it this way you know People say, okay, you have to brand yourself. You're a believer in that. Obviously, you, you know, you, you type in C-H-E and your name comes up on Google. So you're a believer in that and you're very good at it. But people think because they see that, the branding is, okay, I have a website, I have an image, I have a logo, whatever it is, and I'm putting it out there. When you and I both know that that would last a minute if content weren't behind it. And I think the same thing goes with, with, with culture. People again, think that, you know, I have to have what I see and I, I oh, that's a cool idea and, and they're imitators or they're parrots of it. And the reality is, I think it all starts. Now I'll say it this way at the heart of every great company is a clear sense of purpose. Yeah. And, and, and I think young people, you mentioned millennial gen Y, you know, um, they're smart, they're sharp, but they, and, and, you know, and they're not necessarily motivated in my experience, by money, motivated by money. They want to make money, show them a way to do it and, and, and they'll do it, but they are motivated by passion. And I think that they're entering the workforce and they want to understand what your company's value are and they get turned on by that. And, mm -hmm. um, and they're at work. Everybody I have, you know, you look at them and I think you said this, I, I heard something recently. You said, where you, you said, you know, there's uh, you, you named a statistic on how many millennials were on the planet. And you said, you can't stereotype them with, with, with entitlement and, and, you know, and laziness or, or whatever. And the truth is that's so true because I have millennials here that will outwork me. They, 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 they exhaust me. I'm like, go home, you know, no, don't, don't, don't text me or email me at one in the morning, you know, that kind of thing, but they want to do it. And I think it yeah. all starts with purpose. I think the clear, clear, concise sense of purpose, where you're going, what your company's values are, what you stand for. And I think that they will literally kill themselves to working to make something happen to try to try to make it happen I, I just that's my opinion well I think that's awesome to hear David and obviously this will be the 
a common thread of conversation throughout the hour. So I'm about to send out Q2, being that we're already 11 minutes in. So let's just get your uh, answers for Q2 prepped, okay. sending them out via Twitter and Blab right now, and then we'll dive into more conversation. Okay, here we go. Q2, set. Such a great question. All right, so Q2, David, and we also, we're also we welcoming call-ins tonight. So if you are on Blab or you're on Twitter and you want to give us a ring and speak to David and myself live, feel free to do so. We're taking callers throughout the evening. Um, okay, so question number two. So you talk about the importance of innovation. Um, how do you inspire that within your team? Yeah, great, great question. And I, I say, I'll start by saying this. I think that every stellar organization, every organization that's worth its salt that is, is going to grow and, and accomplish something substantial. I think that it's born of innovation and, you know, I think it's, it's more, how do you foster it in, in the, you know, we come from the old school, you know, we were, we were taught, you know, a top down philosophy that, you know, that there was this, there was this echelon, upper echelon of individuals that made decisions, you know, and it was like, it was passed down as, Hey, by the way, this is what we're going to do. And this is the new policy, or this is the new procedure. And, and Hey, this is how we're going to do it. And it's, and, and we, and we clamped, you know, um, we almost treated everyone as they were thankful to have a job, and, and, and that doesn't foster growth. I love that word foster. To me, it's, you know, I'm thinking of, of, of birthing. I'm thinking of, of, you know, incubating. And, and to me, that's, that's growth and that's activity and that's enlargement. And so challenge the individuals, I feel, that work in, on the ground, in the business on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think collaboration is a huge, um, a huge part of that. And, you know, uh, to me, um, you know, regular brainstorming meetings, uh, you know, where, individuals that that possibly aren't the leader normally or maybe they're the quiet one and they're not going to step up and come to you and go oh hey i have an idea and they're sit quiet and you think that they're on board but the reality is they're they're dying inside because they have something they want to offer and contribute so i think that involving this is another one involving a diverse group you know of individuals you know um in all in all diversities within the organization and uh, again you know we have a I challenge sometimes uh, individuals within certain organizations. We have about, we have about our, uh, departments, about six or seven, like, um, you know, substantial type departments where there's maybe eight, 10 or more. So say six, six or so um, where there's that many. And I'll challenge them to meet in a brainstorming session once a month. And, but I say, you can't have anyone else from your division, go find someone in another division and they meet in these small, smaller group settings. And that's one of the ways that we've really, um, welcome that. And I think, I think uh, one last thing I'll say about innovation, because here's the thing, these ideas, again, keep in mind if the culture is right. And that helps build the culture. If the culture is right. Then they're not, you don't have to run worry about somebody running off. This is what business owners think. Oh, they're going to run off and they're going to do something on their own. Well, first of all, if that happens, then great, because you could be a part of that in someone's life. You know, I can't, I can always say this, they can't move you out of the way they can only move you up. Mm -hmm. And, and so, uh, so one, one last thing I'll say is, you know, um, no idea is a bad idea and welcome those. And if the culture is right, that individual will offer great ideas because they act as if they own your company. They act as if they've drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Yeah. You know, and I think there are two kinds of, of company cultures today. I mean, there are a lot, but you know, let's bracket them into like two big themes. One is the companies like, you know, like yours, like, you know, my, my current agency, The Impulse, we wanted to pursue, you know, um, we, we wanted to infuse entrepreneurship in every single one of our employees so that they were working as hard as the co-founders slash really right. believed that, you know, um, we were also looking out for their best interests because it has to be a two way street. I think that, you know, that, that mutual symbol symbiotic relationship is also what creates, you know, um, just genuine company culture amongst rapport within the employees under the roof every day. And um, so I think you have the companies that are newer, younger, more startup, and then they're able to breed a company culture from scratch versus a lot of the older corporations 
that, you know, you have the baby boomers still running the show who have the um, fear against millennial employees and the, the, with the stereotypes of millennials being entitled and lazy and narcissistic, but also that they don't understand how to relate to them. They don't know how to communicate to them. And you just see such a divide between generations under the workplace. And then you also see um, a job hoppers, you know, millennials who are job, uh, hopping from job to job and not staying, you know, three plus years and actually being loyal to the corporation. So, so so many times when I'm speaking on behalf of millennials in the workplace for corporate that, you know, is having the, um, the, the problem of relating to millennials in the workplace, um, they're so scared to in, encourage change. And then if they do encourage change, it, it's, it doesn't, it's not consistent. So I also think that it's up to the employees to voice their opinion in a united way. Um, and so for the people who are listening, who are currently in corporate that has that lack of innovation, what should the employee do to try to have their opinions or voice their opinion if they're, if they're not getting the opportunity to, you know, speak their mind? Yeah. And, and Chelsea, I'll say this too, if, if I may, um, you know, cause I think that, and I, and I want to emphasize, and I think that, um, I am so excited about this whole, uh, this, this era in our, in our, in our, you know, in our lives in, um, in America in, and where, because I think that there's going to be millennials and there already are, but they're going to be millennials that really start to increase and make money and, and, and rise up in the corporate world. And, and so with that being said, there was, there was a guy that's a friend of my family's he's, he's literally 80 years old, but he works every day. And, um, he's, he's worth, he's worth over a hundred million dollars. He just sold a company privately held for $66 million. So supposedly the guy's got a lot of money, has been successful and came to me in our building, ran into me, knows what I do. And was, Hey, I got a question for you. He's known, known me since I was a kid. My father used to work for him in the, in the early eighties. And he said, Hey, he said, um, I, I'm having such a problem. And he, he called them young people. <laughs> he said with young people. And he said, I can't, I don't know how to motivate them. I don't know how to train them. And this guy's worth a hundred plus million dollars standing there in the lobby asking me what to do. And, it, and, it, and it, I loved it because he doesn't, they don't know what to do. And he, and he's ready to discard somebody. But my question is this, what happens when he's gone? You know, I mean, does your business, your legacy, does everything you built just die on the vine? You know, yeah, millennials do things differently and they communicate differently. But s s as we're increasing, as we're getting older, is, isn't that the way the business is going to go? And I think that um, innovation is is there. I think that millennials are ready. And I think that um, I think we need to become millennial magnets um, rather than millennial repellent. And that's the thing that. that. That's so. awesome. That is awesome. We need to become millennial magnets instead of millennial repellent. That is so great. Um, all right. Well, let's get ready to send out Q3. I see somebody's calling. Hold on one second, caller. Let's at least get Q3 out there so everyone can start thinking about their opinion, their questions. You know what? In the meantime, David, at West Gay did send out a question asking you, how do you define innovation for your team? Well, the great question. And uh, I think it starts with, and I, this is going to sound a little bit redundant, but it's going to, it starts with the team, meaning that um, I empower leaders um, and uh, have, and, and there, there is no one that makes it onto my leadership team. I don't care regardless of their age. I have, millenn I have millennials, uh, I have young millennials on, on my leadership team. And then I have uh, those that are baby boomers and it starts with the leadership and they have to and are challenged to recognize the innovators on their team. And so um, I define that as knowing their role. I mean, staying within a lane of, okay, I'm, I'm in the marketing department or I'm in the production department or I'm in our, in our you know, call center or business development department or sales department. Of course, they have their ultimate objectives and mission, company missions, and we lay that out. And then within that you know, when, when I meet with my leaders, that's one of the things we do in our leadership meetings. I, I, I don't get up and just, just preach. I get up and say, okay, Hey, look, let's talk guys. You know, I want to know what's going on within your team. Talk, talk about, you know, who, who stands out, what's going on. And they're challenged to, to the person that asked this question to find those people and listen to those people and discover those people. If, 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 if that's not happening on a regular basis, then I'm, then I'm, then something's wrong. And I look at me first in the mirror, but I want to find out what's going on mm -hmm. and why we're not, why that's not happening. I, I go back to that incubator thing. We should constantly be producing new stuff, new things, new ideas, new people and, and, and giving the, that, that opportunity, you know? And so 
hopefully that answers it. But that's how I define it. I define it as, I mean, obviously if it's, if it doesn't even have anything to do with our business model, you know, then, then that, that would be, you know, that wouldn't be right. But, but if it fits within who we are, you know, and fits within our mission and vision statement, you know, then it's going to, um, then it's, then, then I encourage, I encourage them to bring their ideas and there, there are no bad ideas. I don't think so either. Let's take a caller, David. Okay. Let's see if we can get him on the line. John. Hey, Chelsea. How Hi, are you? How are you? Well, well. Hi, David. How are you? I'm wonderful, sir. John Graham with us. Thanks so much for calling in. Got a question? Got a piece of advice? Got anything on your mind? Yeah, so it's a phenomenal conversation. Uh, awesome topic. One that I'm intimately aware of, both as a millennial in corporate America um, and have seen the negative uh, expression of, of terrible culture and then the complete contrast in an amazing culture for millennials. And I, and I just wanted to suggest that um, I think the, the inspiration comes when you have a company that recognizes the value of giving, um, you know, our generation a seat at the table yeah. um, and an opportunity to express without fear of being shut down because it's not in alignment with the traditional um, uh, industrial model, right? Where it's, you know, just, just keep kicking out widgets. So I wanted to get your thoughts on, um, you know, there was a question asked on, in, the, in the chat here. What, what do you do when, you, when you're in a horrible culture as a struggling visionary millennial, right? And you're, you're, you're bucking the industrial system. How do you, how do you operate within that, that environment? You want my way? I would love to hear your opinion, Dave. As well, I don't know. I, I, okay. Now, this, now I'm a little, I'm a, I, I don't know how this is going to go over, but um, I, I'm just going to give my honest opinion. Um, get a new job. And, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm, I'm being very honest with you I, because, you know, my, my father used to tell me this my entire life growing up. He was a mentor to me in, in, uh, in training and sales and leadership. He said, you can't teach a pig to sing. He said that you're, you're going to, you're going to piss off the pig and you're going to frustrate yourself. Sure. And so basically you, you can't do anything about, your boss, I mean, um, or, or the person that possibly your boss has hired, you know, to run a division. And unfortunately I hear that and I'm asked that question so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, if you live in Florida, come work or, or, and, you, and if you're good, come work for me. Um, but I, there's, there's, there's tons of companies, you know, and you're doing the right thing, John, by hanging out on chats like this too, because you're going to find somebody that has a like vision that sees you and sees an incredible talent. And, um, and giftings and they're going to reach out and, and, um, but I would say find, find a place where, where that can be unleashed because, um, you got a lot in you. Yeah. You know? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I experienced that, uh, that blessing as it were six months ago. So I'm with the company that is an absolute perfect fit. Right. But, um, but it, it's one of those things where you come from a, a terrible culture that says we want to embrace new ideas and innovation. Uh, we, we want to hear what you say, but when you do it, uh, it, it literally gets shut down. So it's one of those things where uh, the company messaging or the culture says, yes, we're ready, but the leadership does everything uh, to thwart that, that, that progress. So it's control. It's a control issue. And Hey, John, hey, let me hear your ideas. Oh, not now. Oh, hey, John, let me hear your ideas. Yeah. Not that one. Yep. You know, that kind of thing. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. Um, I'll tell you when we do, um, when we do, do, do a lot of uh, training here, um, and we'll have workshops and we'll have individuals come in, owners of companies, and they say they want to change. But then the reality is they it's up to them to implement that as well. So there are those who are trying to because because it's really it's change or die. I mean, that's really what it is, because, you know, it's, it's getting to a place where um, innovation exists and, and, you know, and your company is not irreplaceable. You know, uh, mo most companies out there. So Absolutely. I think it's um it, it has to be embraced. And uh you know, it shows like Chelsea's. This is this. I think this type of um, show is 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 definitely needed more more often. Chelsea's my hero. That's all I wanted to say. I will certainly oh, drop them. Making me blush <laughs> over here. <laughs> right you know, Thank you so much, baby. I have to tell you too, John. I act, I really love your your question, your comment, and um, I recently just went through the same feeling of you know 
it just not a healthy environment, not a healthy work environment. And it was starting to also affect my, my personal life because I realized, you know, I feel that we're so consumed by work today because we're always plugged in, right? We can't necessarily turn off that easily. The millennials that are working till one in the morning can because they can access their email on their iPhone that's probably next to them on their nightstand. So, um, you know, I think that we all need to really listen to our intuition and listen to our gut. Also, I feel like, you know, I, I knew that certain things were not okay, but I was letting them go on too long. Mm -hmm. And I was upset with myself that I really wasn't listening to my intuition. I wasn't listening to myself. I wasn't listening to my own unhappiness. And if you're really, you know, feeling that, then, and, and you at least have, you know, tried to communicate to the best of your ability, then it's, you know, that much more of a transparent, um, uh, you know, vision of you needing to leave that and, and find your new. Um, so I'm all about change. I think change also breeds a lot of innovation and passion. I also love getting inspired by other people. I love, and that's what collaboration is for me, you know, working with all these other influencers all the time. So I'm happy to hear that you were, didn't stick around and you made the change. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was one of the best days of my life. Literally. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for calling in. Have a no good problem. one. Good yes, take care. All right, David. Let's uh, send out. I don't even know what question we're on. Oh, Q4. Here we go. Send out Q4 right now on Blab. And let's send it out on Twitter. Sending out. Okay, this is a great question too. All these questions are great tonight. All right, so David, question four is, as the CEO of IPD, how do you get the buy-in of your leaders for your vision and mission? Oh, another great question. And um, well, it's, it's uh, you know, it's funny because the CEO, and uh, sometimes you have to be, and I don't mean this literally necessarily, but sometimes you have to be the janitor. Sometimes you have to be, you know, I think that sometimes we as a CEO, you know, or, or somebody who's in an executive position sits in an office and, you know, and, and, and kind of manages from a top, again, a top down uh, style. And the buy in is going to come from action and activity. And I think, I think that, uh, you know, it's to me, it's, it's, it's all about vision and mission. And, and again, a vision, and again, there's, there's, you've heard vision and mission statements probably, you know, so many times and, and, and it's not anything new, but I define a vision statement for uh, as for me and for our company, it's for our customers. For instance, you know, every main product we have in our company in different divisions, we have a vision statement, which, which speaks to our customers. Okay. That's what they're interested in, which keeps us going within well, a mission statement to me. Um, is about your employees. Is about the the internal because how to how to make that vision happen and and be and and to you know to accomplish that vision, it's going to take people. I often say this, you know, Chelsea. Um, you know, uh, it takes people. I don't know how big your vision is, but things that are on the inside of me that keep me up at night, that wake me up early. You know, that 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 I, I obsess over, I think about a lot, and I, I dream about as a visionary. Those types of things are big and yeah. they get bigger. They don't get smaller. And, and so anything that big takes people. And that's what people have to understand. That's what these, these you mentioned change. That's what leaders, um, you know, so-called leaders or managers or owners of companies that are unwilling to change or embrace change. They have to understand that if they have a big vision or want to accomplish something big, it takes people. Mm -hmm. And so the buy-in, I think, is when we have the ability as leaders to convey the message to our people and, and act it out and follow through with it, that they matter. Not only do they matter, but they're part of this, exactly. you know, that they benefit from this and where we're going is going to benefit you and your family. Um, whether that's through, you know, different time off or whether that's through different types of creative incentives and bonuses and, you know, or, but different ways, you know, things. And, and I think that another thing by sitting down one on one you know, with individuals and having leadership sit down one-on-one -on -one and get to know each person and, and what moves them and motivates them. I think that having individual incentives, you know, walking up and just a f affirmation sometimes, you know, sometimes just um, we'll walk around and, and say something to somebody that, Hey, you just, that was, that was phenomenal what you did. You know, I, I, I can't believe how amazing that was. And just, you see their face light up, just little things like that. And I think that when they see that in action, and that's really the key. I think so many times we speak it. I don't know if it were, it were you or, or John that said that, you know, so many times people say it. 
They say yeah. it, they say it, they say it, but they don't, you know, they don't act it. Well, and correct. I think that when people see the genuineness, you know, and that you, you really mean it. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, talent, you know, I know we're gonna get into talent in a minute, but you know, one of the ways to find really, really good talent is to, um, is to have individuals who are bought in, tell somebody else about it because that's the, that's, you know, when someone's bought into where you're headed and where you're going and why you're going there and, and wherever they go, somebody is going to hear about that. And when somebody that hates their job, you know, they're at a restaurant, someone that hates their job sees this person that loves their job, but doesn't own it. They want to go work there. So I think buy ins a big deal. And, um, I think it comes through action. And when they see it acted out enough, I think at that point, then they go, they believe it. I, and they're bought in. More. I feel that if it's not, it, you know, the whole practice, what you preach, right. But it's not, we shouldn't be preaching. We should, it should be something that's, you know, innately native to, you know, you as an, as a business owner, I really mm -hmm. do believe, especially if you're the one instilling the vision amongst your team. But, um, you know, the double standard of people who, you know, um, project things on to, onto their employees and then, you know, let it lax for themselves or let it slide for themselves. And I, I, so many consulting opportunities, um, so many different brands, so many different company cultures I've gotten to meet and work with over the course of the few years and mm -hmm. the people um, that are stubborn who are the people who are supposed to be you know literally pioneering the change pioneering the effort pioneering the vision um, if they don't have it and if they're not open to it I feel that that has complete ripple effect through the rest of the corporation would you agree a hundred percent because it's you know this whole because it's it's do as I say not as I do and wow. and people that's not genuine and we're talking we're having millennial talk tonight so that <laughs> that that might fly that doesn't fly with anybody I, mean, I think that's just human talk but you certainly aren't going to get that over on Gen Y or on a millennial you're not going to get that over on someone who literally will call you out in a New York second yep. you're done yep. And I always say this about um, user generated content, content that we're always posting about our favorite brands because we genuinely love it. So, for example, if I'm eating a cheesy bag of Doritos and I take a picture of myself, I love me some Doritos. That's user generated content, content that I just posted on behalf of Doritos because I love it. And I feel right. like, you know, um, and because I work in the influencer space, I'm always, you know, trying to instill UGC. And it's like kind of instill UGC amongst your employees. Right. And I always yeah. say that UGC millennials who are creating this content, employees who are working for your corporation, they could be your best publicist or your worst nightmare because they will take it to social media to share their opinion um, and they will voice their opinion if you give them a platform, but you can't close them off. And you can't do the practice what you preach and have that double standard. That's just, that's the way to not aggregate and attain and retain millennial loyalty in the workplace. 100% agree. Absolutely. All right. So, 34 minutes in, let's get out Q5 right now. Sending it out on Blab, here we go. Sending out on Twitter, here we go. Okay, so Q5, David. Um, in the competitive world we live in, what methods do you find work best for recruiting and retaining the top talent? Um, I, I love this one because somebody would read this, you know, initially and say, what does this have to do with culture? Even though the retaining obviously has to do with culture, but what, what does recruiting the top talent have to do with culture? And I think that it, it has everything to do with culture because there's a lot of companies out there, even companies that are, you know, all over social media that are just screaming from the rooftop, you know, money, 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 money. And, and Hey, you know, uh, and, 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 and this, the focus is on money. I think that, um, I think that to attract the top talent, you have to get beyond money and, you know, because, because anyone that, that does a real amount of business can offer somebody a paycheck. It takes a lot more than money in my experience to, to attract the best people. They're motivated by passion. And, yep. you know, that's not to say that money is not important because, you know, obviously it is, but if money was the motivation, this is, this is my experience. If money were the motivation, then people would bail out as soon as they realized that they could make more somewhere else. And so if, if that's true and money's obviously not the number one factor, then what is? And I think that to recruit the top talent, I think, you know, those individuals 
change their focus from, from, you know, from the external to personal growth and happiness. What makes me happy and how, because, you know, you know, I, I make more money today than I've ever made in my life, but I'm turned on by developing people. And I wasn't turned on by developing people necessarily 20 years ago. I didn't know this yet, you know? And so I think that it's up to me to instill into people that I'm leading, regardless of their age and say, Hey, look, it, you know, it's about, it's about developing people because I'll say this about money. And, and, and maybe, maybe those would agree that if you develop people, if you put people first, and if, if you find a way to, to pl- create an atmosphere and a culture where people are happy money, I say, will chase you down. It'll tackle you. It'll knock you over. Like my, like, like my older big cousin used to do when I was little and he'd sit on top of me. Money will sit on you. It, it'll find you. You won't be able to spend it all. I mean, it's like it's, you don't have to worry about it. It'll be because it's attached to the needs of the people that you serve. And so, I mean, people do their best work when they're passionately engaged. Passion provides, you know, somebody fulfillment in their work. And I think that that's how you retain talent. That's how you attract talent. Because I know this, I know other talented people. Now, the people I know, a lot of people wouldn't come work for me because maybe they own their own businesses. But my employees also know talented people. You know, some of my employees now that are talented don't hang out with people that don't share some of their same common goals. So if I want to find other talented people, I start by retaining mm-hmm. the talented people. Right. And they're going to they're start telling people they find out in their circles about it. And I think That's- I think your method of, you know, pursuing entrepreneurship within your employees, you know, treating them as an equal, not necessarily in this hierarchy where, you know, it's like, do as I say, not as I do. Um mm-hmm also allows you to have like the best word of mouth, you know, your company culture, like you said that, you know, your, your, your employees hang out with like-minded individuals. Well, they're talking to their friends about work. Everybody talks, you know, with their friends about the struggles, the good and the bad that come along with their job. And when they hear about, you know, their, their friend talking about their company's culture in such a, such a positive light, that's how, you know, that's how the word of mouth really starts to, you know, get out there. And I think that's also one of the most effective ways of retaining millennials is that when you have this word of mouth, you know, not just it says it on, in a tweet, this company has great corporate culture when your employees are actually advocating that for you um so i think you're you're such an inspiration david to millennials who are who are ceos but also for i think generations older you know gen xers and baby boomers who are ceos who who still are passionate about connecting with the next generation who still are passionate about wherever they work and making sure that that it continues to grow as they're you know in charge um to to really act as you do (laughs) not necessarily maybe act as they do if they're if they're having these problems well thank you you know um it's uh atmosphere and culture i think culture is is atmosphere is a result of the culture but you know it's it's so important in chelsea one of the things um, just happened this past week or three, that's three or four days, starting Friday, I believe we were hiring and we had, I think between Friday and tomorrow, 30 interviews set up of, uh, and we had, we've had already uh, 20, some, some odd interviews come in. And I will tell you that 90% of the people that walked in the door, walked in and said to my receptionist, they said, wow, the, the atmosphere in here, I'm, I'm talking like overwhelmingly different people. They go, I've never experienced anything, anything like it. And I mean, people literally told us in the interviews or told, told the uh, people that were interviewing, they, some of them were saying, I, I want this job. I want to, I want to be here. This atmosphere, they continue to say that. And that's not about me. A matter of fact, Friday, have to, I'm, I just bought a new house and I was actually closing and moving and doing some things. I wasn't even here one of those days. It wasn't me. So it made me happy to know I wasn't here. It didn't make me sad. It made me happy to know I wasn't here. And those comments were happening, you know, and uh, that's, that's what it's all about. It's about culture. So um, you, you hit it right on the head and, you know, it's, it's really so important. And, um, and uh, anyway, so I don't even know what generation I am. I, I'm 43 years old. I don't know what generation I am. Am I, what what am I considered? Gen Xer. You're Gen Xer. I'm pretty yeah. 90% sure you're Gen Xer. I remember when I was young, people said that Gen Xer, they called us slackers. They called, they were like, they, they, we have no ambition or what have you. I think that's what it was. So, you know, I, I, you know, to me, I think they're people. And I think that people um, are motivated, you know, by, uh, by their happiness and their purpose. And I, I'm going to tell you, if you find a way to motivate people, you've, you've found something special. 
Uh, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I'm just sending out question six. We got 20 minutes to go, and we have a total of 10 questions tonight. Um, I'm also, um, I'm, look, I'm just trying to comb through Twitter to make sure I'm not skipping any questions that might come directly through Twitter for you, David. Um, well, I just sent out question number six. I think this is um, such a great question. I mean, I think I said that about every question so far. Um, so let's get into um, culture ambassadors. So you talked about culture ambassadors um, <clears throat> in your article for Forbes. Um, so what does culture ambassadors mean to you? Um, how are they beneficial? How could we pursue going into about building our own? Let's let's dive into that. Sure. Um, I think it's you know uh, culture ambassadors. It's it, it, title titles uh, i'm not i'm not so much on titles but if you don't have one and you're listening you know and you don't have somebody possibly even putting somebody in that position um or putting someone in the position of discovering culture ambassadors they're people that are within your organization currently right now and you know even if they don't have the title on them which obviously that's not a title that you hear very often um they're there and those are the people who are most who are most passionate they care the most about your company's mission your company's values and they're willing to communicate this is the key that message with passion and that's that's the key and, and those are the ones when you go into an organization it's it's my receptionist okay and was the most excited person about the comments of the atmosphere is great go figure my she's a culture ambassador she is she was so excited to to, to tell me that and to me, that's a culture ambassador. So they're the ones who care most about the mission, the values of an organization. And they're, they don't they don't only care, but they're willing to communicate it. And you can find them in, in, in any way. And that doesn't mean they're going to be vocal. Some of the culture ambassadors I have that work here are very, you know, more behind the scenes, maybe some programmers that we have here or, you know, web developers. They don't talk very much possibly. But guess what? I know they're culture ambassadors because they're sending a tweet out about something to do with our organization and say something positive. And if you look at their feed, they don't do that about anything else, you know, but yet, th so that's, that's my indication. That's an indication to me that, Hey, you know what? That person cares. That person is a culture ambassador. So um, I think that those are individuals. And I think that again, uh, one of the things I'll say about that really quick, I know we have to move on is a culture ambassador is a key to retaining um, and attracting top talent a culture ambassador, because those are the ones that are going to say it at the restaurant. Those are the ones that are going to say it when somebody, you know, uh, walks into the company, those are the ones. And, uh, it's like a director of first impression would be also somebody that would be a great, you know, culture ambassador. You know, what are they seeing when they come in? I don't want anybody walking into my office and, and I'd rather be in disarray physically, but have somebody there with a smile on their face, absolutely just blowing them away. Yeah. I love that culture ambassador. I, you know, we, I, you, I use the term brand ambassador all the time, you know, when activating these influencers to work on behalf of campaigns or companies, which is really interesting. As I was saying that out loud, I was kind of thinking about how that's really such a um, millennial and modern way to establish um, company culture because an influencer is really the extension of your brand messaging. So that has to be somewhat of an extension of your corporate culture. Um, and and it's really interesting to see the ones that are really treat the influencers as transactions, right? Like, okay, I will pay you two hundred dollars to do X, Y, and Z, versus mm -hmm. the people who really want to get to know you and empower you as right. an influencer on behalf of, you know, Chase yep. or Bank of America, whatever, whatever the brand or the corporation might be. And right. I think that's exactly, you know, and and and. and that, and that's why I keep, I might have two split brains tonight. We're talking like old school corporate and then also like new school that has, of course, that digital tech and social element. Um, right. and it's so interesting how we're having these conversations now, David. And I wonder what the conversations are going to be like in 10 years when remote work even rolls out that much more. So just imagine, you know, uh, company culture in just five, 10 years from now where sure. Big, big businesses might not necessarily need to have an office structure where, you know, 100, 200 employees come every day. They It could just be all remote. Um, and how you're going to instill corporate culture if you're not creating an environment that breeds the culture. So it's just so interesting to know what fast evolving times we're in. And this conversation's going to evolve. And for the people who are not evolving with it, you know, it's going, they're going to be left in the past, unfortunately. 
Yeah. And, and, and really, really, really quick Starbucks, you know, a few years ago uh, when their former CEO that started the company came back, uh, this has been many years now, but when the reason he came back and I remember right at that particular time, I drink five shots of espresso every day. So I don't drink anything in it. So it's really hard to mess that up. And I remember going to um, the same Starbucks every morning. The drink was great. And I, my assistant one day went and bought me a Starbucks out of Target or something, same drink. And it was just didn't taste the same second day. Didn't taste the same. And so I remember thinking, wow, somebody is not doing it right. And right around that time frame, I heard on the news or something that that uh, I read somewhere that they brought their CEO back. And here's the reason why. The message that was here at top wasn't reaching the store level. There was a bottleneck in middle management. So you hit it right on the head. And it's it's there's that culture wasn't wasn't it wasn't reaching the store level so it wasn't it was it, there was no message of culture and so it's all about leadership because obviously Chelsea you said this I mean I think it's important because what you're doing right now is you're you're reaching big huge corporations as well and I think that you're a bridge you mm -hmm. know that um, is is very important because these companies don't want to die I mean they don't want to go away so they want to remain relevant and I think that you're a key part of that well, thank you, David. Well, I always like to say, you know, back when I was 16 years old and started Teen Talk Live, which was the start to it all, I never I never in a million years thought that anybody but teenagers would tune in because it was Teen Talk Live. We were talking about all teen issues. Right. Little did I know, just as many parents and grandparents were tuning in because they were felt so disconnected from the millennial generation and they were trying to get insight on how to appeal or relate or understand their, their child or grandchild and I feel that you know now 10 years later that kind of uh, that that effect is happening but now for corporate and millennial employees and the CEOs are um, you know our parents and grandparents so it's you know it's a, I feel like it's an evolution and the millennial conversation is still so here um, and I think that, you know I, that so many generations you know generation X baby boomer they also had so many negative stereotypes slapped on them lazy entitled narcissistic you know mm -hmm. however I do think that Millennials are truly a generation unlike any generation thus far. We have the internet. We have so many things available at our fingertips that did not exist, you know, for Generation X and Baby Boomer. So, of course, we're going to be different. Of course, we're going to be wired differently. Of course, we're going to multitask in a different way because look at how many things we're doing all at one time right now. How many elements right. we're using to communicate. So, um, I feel that I'm hanging. I'm hanging with it. How about that? I'm impressed that I'm actually, I'm not like, I'm not uh, exploding over here. You know, I could have your, your team hoping. That's right. <laughs> there you go. And that's the way to do it. And I, also, They're hanging. I love how you said, you know, big visions take a, take an army, right? Takes a village. Um, yeah. And sometimes I feel that for, for all of us, you know, personal business owners um, where um, we feel like the world is on our shoulders because we have to do it all. Like we don't think to allow people to come in maybe because we have that control, um, you know, that, that, that fear of losing control. So for people who are also small business, David, right? Because we have so many right. entrepreneurs using social media to monetize their passion, monetize their social audience. You know, right. how do you how do you go about building corporate culture that actually might revolve around you, right? Me or the the, the jewelry artist or the painter mm -hmm. or the singer or the fashion blogger? Then the person is the is the brand. Yeah, well, I mean, I I can relate to that because as as a starting entrepreneur, I, I started in my bedroom and um and uh, I remember I remember one day and this is this this is kind of embarrassing in some ways, but I my father called me and I was in uh, I was you know my early 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 twenties um and uh, I was in my I was in a box of shorts and no shirt and I'm making sales calls. He calls me and I'm in my bedroom and my my young, my oldest daughter was a little baby and my dad goes, "You're in your underwear," and I went, "What?" He goes, you're in your underwear. And I went, what are you talking? He goes, are you in your underwear? And I said, yeah. He goes, look, he goes, get up every day. And you know, he began to tell me what back then, what he, what he knew, but what I relate that to now is, you know, I needed whatever the culture, you know, that, that, that was important for that time. That's what he was speaking of. So I would say it's extremely important because, you know, distraction is the enemy of direction. And I think that if you're by yourself, what keeps me focused a lot of times are the many pieces that are moving around me. And so, so that is something that keeps, keeps me focused. So if you're if I'm by myself and I'm, and I'm, and I'm left alone for, for too long and I'm working in that environment with me, I get distracted. Mm -hmm. And, and 
you, go figure, right? I get distracted when I'm by myself or when I have idle time more, more than I do when I'm, when I'm extremely focused with a lot of pieces moving around me. So I would, I, I feel for that person. And, um, you know, I think that the distraction being the enemy of direction, I think that, you know, g- set up your culture. If it's just you, you know, g- find out what motivates you and what your purpose is and then and then create that environment. And I think it's extremely important, um, and especially if you want to grow beyond that, um, because here's the pro- one, one thing I'll say about that. If you don't set it up when you're by yourself or there's a couple of people or five people, then what are you going to do when there's 20? What are you going to do? And, you know, it's not going to happen on its own. And right. so I, I'll say that that chaos breeds chaos. Right. Yeah. Chaos, chaos breeds chaos. And if you have chaos at five, you're going to have extreme chaos at 20. And it's then, then, then it's going to be too late to kind of dial back and you're going to lose people because right. then all of a sudden you change what, you know, what, what's comfortable for them. So. Absolutely. Like I couldn't agree more. It has to start the foundation. If it doesn't start the foundation, it can't all of a sudden miraculously happen, which is why for all of these big corporations who are trying to all of a sudden make this pivot now, Mm -hmm. and it's not within their true brand DNA, it's going to be really interesting to see how corporate um, company culture does evolve because the times are clearly changing as are, as you know, we're all getting older, we're all getting wiser. And now the corporations have to, I think, get wiser. And that also means, you know, get with the times in order to stay relevant. Unfortunately, some of them will have, some of them will go through, unfortunately, they're going to have to go through like executive changes probably when it gets to that level. And, you know, and that's a lot of times what happens. I mean, um, Ford went through that a few years ago and I mean, and they, and they, you know, and they just, they exploded. And then now they've been a a newer CEO a couple of years ago, the one transition CEO from former CEO of Boeing did an incredible job. And then now the current CEO, you know, is just, he's, he's doing things completely different. So with inside of that organization, there's extreme, culture change but it happened through a lot of a lot of uh, internal you know change unfortunately so but that's i think it's necessary in some of these and of course they're board driven things like that but absolutely that's where you come in <laughs> <laughs> happy to come in um all right well we only have a little less than 10 minutes david we have right. a few more questions left to go so all question right. eight is um what do you do if the dna of your company is it isn't what it should be so this is talking about the pivot you know if it's not um in a healthy place how do you go about really trying to shift yeah um if it's your company um i think that you know recognizing it a lot of times um you know, a lot of times as the top person, male, female, really, it doesn't matter. People say that, that a lot of times that, you know, um, men have egos, women don't have. I, I, I disagree with that. I think I think if you're successful to some degree, you're going to fight um, somewhat of I know what I'm talking about syndrome. And um, and I think that, number one, you have to recognize that there's an issue. If the DNA or the, the you know, the natural alignment, that's what I DNA stands for, you know, developing natural alignment. Um if, if that DNA is, is not where it should be in an organization, I have to look in the mirror first. I've got to go, okay, where am I dropping the ball? Because really, you know, a f- fish, you know, stinks from the head down, so to speak. It's, it's on me. Uh, one of my favorite leaders um, was an old football coach, Paul, Paul Bear Bryant, used to be an Alabama football coach. And one of the things he, I loved about his leadership before it was cool, you know, is he, he would go in the locker room and if they, if they won the game, I'm sorry, if they lost the game, he'd say, hey, guys, you know what? I apologize. You know, I let you down. And if they did good, he'd say, we did a good job. And if they won and they did outstanding, he'd go, guys, you were great. And I think that that's really what it comes down to. I have to look in the mirror and take responsibility. And I expect that, of course, from my leadership team because I model that. And, um, and I think that that's where it starts. And I think then making some and not letting it fester, not letting it get to the place where it's ignored, you know, not avoiding it. Um, there's a book I have uh, that uh, by Patrick Patrick Lesion, which is the Five Temptations of a CEO, and uh, one temptation in there that I think that I struggle with more than anything is the um, wanting someone to like me um, and people that I work with. So basically, the result of that temptation in this book is that I let someone go four months from now because they're not doing something that I want them to do, but I never told them that I expected them to do it. And um, so I think not letting something get to the place where you're unhappy with it is also a key. Yes. Uh, I know when you let it fester too long and then it's kind of even harder to dial it back. If you do have that face-to-face confrontation, that's always, that's always, that's always a hard one, which I'm sure a lot of us can relate to. Um, All right. Let's send out Q9. I definitely want to make sure that we tap all of the questions being that all of 
are so good. Um, what do you do with the people that just never seem to buy in? So um, maybe you just hit, you started, started to talk, just talk about that. But there are some people that, you know, you try to make it fit. Or at what point do you know if this is just not working? Yeah. And, and this is a big one. And I want to say, um, one of the, one of the last things, you know, pruning is, is re the removal of, of something that is, uh, that is, that is unproductive, you know, to prune, prune a plant, what have you. I think there's some stages of pruning that Dave Anderson, uh, CEO of Learn to Lead talks about that. And he, he gives it three, three options. The third option is ultimately what happens if you can't get a buy-in, but number one is realignment. And number two is revitalize. So you either try to realign something if it's out of line, revitalize it, you know, or br try to bring it back to life. Maybe it was there before, maybe it's off track. I'm, I'm talking about it or they, and if they can't get on board, ultimately, then you have to remove it. So there's three R's. So revitalize, realign, or remove. And unfortunately, you know, and this is where I would challenge somebody because a lot of times the people that, that are not buying in are top performers in some way. They may be making you money. It's very difficult for us as, as leaders that care about the bottom line to get rid of somebody like that. I think it's, it's something that can literally cost you a lot of money down the road if you're not willing to address it now. So ultimately if they won't buy in, they got to go. All right. They don't buy in, they got to go. All right. Well, that leads us to our last question of the night, David, about to send it out and send it out on Twitter as well. Okay. Do, do, do. Here we go. If I had like a third set of hands, I'd also be taking notes because you just have some great like one liners that are just so on point, David. You need to like send out like a spoonful of tweets with all your one liners for tonight. I think a lot of people are, are actually quoting a lot of your one liners too. Um, they're right on the money. Okay. Why can't I send this tweet? Hello. <laughs> Hello. There we go. Okay. Last question of the night, Q10. What should leaders be looking for within their company to diagnose their culture or DNA, as you call it? That's a cool last question. I, I think that um, I think you should look definitely look within your within your company. And I think that's probably one that the reason I, I like that question as much as I dissect a question, kind of flip it, flip it around a little bit. And I, I thought of the alternative that which most leaders try to look without. The first thing you do is look without put an ad out or, you know, let me let me let me find somebody better, you know, to accomplish and I, where I'm going and what I'm doing. And sometimes those individuals can be um, can be groomed and, and, and brought up within. And, and I'll use one example um, of a, of a friend of mine that uh, runs a couple of really large dealerships. Um, he just bought a new dealership and he owns one of the largest Honda stores in, uh, in the whole, uh, uh, whole Eastern coast of the U S and he just bought a Toyota store and he walked in on day one <clears throat> and he started dismantling some things. Well, a couple of real quick examples. Um, and, and they were doing uh, $50,000 a month in accessory sales. And the person that was there was good, but he went and found somebody who had never sold accessories, never done that, but had a dynamic personality, one of the greatest people, uh, people, people, and put them in that position in the first month, they went from 40,000 or 50,000 to $160,000. And that person had never done it before, but it was because they had the right personality, had the right fit. Um, another example um, in their service drive, one of the service riders, the people that one of the ones responsible for dealing with people, he went and said, okay, this is what I need you to do. I need you to start doing this. Well, the response from this sacred cow individual that was successful relative to the position, you know, was making money, been doing it a long time, not a millennial. And he said, uh, well, he basically said in so many words, I I've, I've kind of grown beyond that, you know, in my, in my career. And he said, okay. And he let him go and he placed somebody else out of the organization in that position. Month one, a green pea that had the right stuff doubled that area of business as well. So I think that a leader that's listening, don't be closed minded to somebody that may not have the pedigree, that may not have the resume, that may not be in your mind the first choice. I think just be open minded and look around. I mean, um, we found so many gems like that in our organization um, and, uh, it, because they had, you know, they have the right stuff and they get it. And one of the real quick, one of the things about that, I think that makes it so true is the fact that a lot of those people already are so bought into the company, the values. And when, when you find them, 
that's the hardest part. You know, you can find a talented person that really doesn't care too much at first about what you do and who you are. They just care about themselves. If you make the wrong decision, you know, um, then that, then you have a lot of backtracking to do. So that's what I would say. I'd say, look around you, open your eyes, you know, be creative and, um, and don't and 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 you know and, and put the offer out there. Um, and uh, one of the one 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 way we did that too, we've done that is just putting it out there and saying, hey, if you know anybody, you know, and of course people in your company, then somebody just kind of drift in and say, hey, you know, and, and they start talking about it, and you just get a feel for it. And next thing you know, we found a great person by just not being closed minded. Yes, yes, David, it was a pleasure having you on Millennial Talk Chat tonight. I really, really, really appreciate you joining us. And I thought your insight was fantastic. And the conversation was flowing everywhere. And I really, um, I'm so happy you joined us this evening. Congratulations mm -hmm. with the company culture you've created at IPD. So many people are saying so many great things about you. I'm sure you have a lot of employees also in engaging because they want to um, tonight. So congratulations. Thank you so much. This is going to be also on YouTube. We are recording the evening so you'll be able to tune back in um, take more notes if you didn't take them uh, enough because there was so much chatter happening and I really appreciate it again thank you David hey Chelsea thank you I appreciate the opportunity have a great night everybody next week Tuesday same place same time you know where to find it everything on ChelseaCross.com just click hashtag millennial talk tab to get the low down for next week David thank you again have a great night everyone Thanks, I'm Chelsea. out more packing for me tonight. <laughs> Have a good right. one. Have a good week.